Welcome everyone and thank you to our alumni, staff, donors, friends and supporters for joining us today. I am Professor Karen Holford, I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Cardiff University and I am also alumna and alumni. You are here tonight as part of the Cardiff community comprising graduates who have finished their study at Cardiff and also friends who are supporting the learning and research of the university. Earlier this week we all celebrated International Women's Day and here at Cardiff we believe it's crucial to celebrate and highlight the achievements of our female students and colleagues. I'm delighted tonight to take the opportunity to showcase three inspiring female PhD student researchers whose work covers a spectrum of research from across the university. Our first speaker is Jill Jones. Jill is in the second year of her PhD at Cardiff Business School, having studied for masters in entrepreneurship at the University of Bristol and another masters in social science research methods. After her undergraduate degree in optometry, Jill pursued a diverse entrepreneurial career. So she has continued that interest in her PhD does Gender Matter? Relationships and Decision-Making Within Business Angel Syndicates in the UK. Our next speaker will be Linda Moot. Linda is in the third year of her PhD, working at Cardiff Systems Immunity Research Institute with her PhD, elucidating the role of the lipid GPR84 axis in the, mute, the immune response in sepsis. Linda gained her bachelor's from Radboud University in the Netherlands and her master's from Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Finally, we shall hear from Eva Paneska. Eva has just finished her PhD in Cardiff School of Earth and Environmental Sciences in the area of glacial microbiology. The title of her PhD was The Role of Heterotrophs in Glacier Surface Ecosystem Productivity. And this focuses on the miniature habitats for microorganisms on the surfaces of glaciers worldwide. Eva joined us at Cardiff, having studied, studied her bachelor's and master's in biotechnology and ge geology at the University of Warsaw in Poland. So just a little bit about tonight. In terms of format th for this evening, we have an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of all, the, all of the presentations. So if you have any questions, please enter them at the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen at any point. And after the speakers, we will get um, to as many questions as time allows in the form of a panel. So I'd like to start the presentations this evening by welcoming Jill Jones, who is representing the College of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences. Jill was this year's winner of the three year thesis competition where we invite PhD students to showcase their research in just three minutes. We should give her a little longer this evening to tell her about her research into female entrepreneurs and the role of female inventors. Welcome, Jill. Hello. Thank you, Karen. Just give me a moment. I'll share my screen. Yes, sure. Go ahead, Jill. Thank you. I think we have it there now, don't we? Perfect. Thank you, Jill. Marvellous. Thank, thank you, Karen. And hello, Karen mentioned my entrepreneurial career and I would describe myself as an entrepreneur. But stop to think about that word. What really comes into your mind when you think of the word entrepreneur? Do you think of someone like myself? Or do you think of, think of somebody more like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, the founders behind companies with global impact, such as Microsoft, Facebook or Amazon? Whatever the size of the business though, entrepreneurial companies change the way that society functions. Whatever the size of the business, they need finance in order to grow. Lack of funding in the early days can lead to long-term business underperformance and even business failure. So where does this funding come from? Bank loans can be expensive and may not always be an option for an unproven business concept. So it's here that business angels come in. Business angels are private investors who group together within syndicates to invest their own time and money into nurturing a new venture through the crucial early stages of business growth. They take shares in the company and effectively become co-creators of the business. Now, I'd just like to share a few background figures with you. In the first three years, 
around 60% of new businesses fail. But with business angel involvement, the chance for business succeeding can be increased by almost 25%. This is because business angels often have an entrepreneurial or a business background. So they don't just invest finance into a company. They also bring a wealth of experience and knowledge and very often a network of contacts to help the new business, uh, the business founder. But gender does matter. In the UK, 86% of business angels are male. And male investors tend to invest in male-led businesses, resulting in 79% of business angel finance going to all male, male teams. The remainder goes to mixed teams or female-led teams. The UK is missing over a million new enterprises due to the lack of um, untapped potential of women entrepreneurs. Think again about that word entrepreneur. The high impact, high growth ventures are dominated by male founders. Women just don't seem to fit the stereotypical entrepreneurial profile. In fact, female led businesses are often associated with underperformance. This is despite the fact that female-led businesses have been found to generate more revenue with less funding. If women started and grew businesses at the same rate as men, it's estimated that a staggering 250 billion pound could be added to the UK economy. But as I said, gender does matter. There are two issues. Firstly, Female-led businesses are not getting the opportunity to access the much-needed finance and support that they need in the crucial early stages of business growth. And secondly, women are not getting the opportunity as investors to contribute their experiences and their perspectives to new company growth. This is important. It's widely recognised that a gender-diverse board improves company performance. So, and both male and female business founders are missing out by not having a diverse investor base. Excuse me. As far as my own research is concerned, I'll be looking at the way that gendered relations and interactions between business angels, between business angels and founders can influence the decision to accept or reject a proposal. I truly believe in the value of entrepreneurship. And it's this belief that has brought me back to university for what is now, I think Karen mentioned the third time. I am only halfway through my doctoral studies, but I've been fortunate enough to already participate in impactful research. Towards the end of last year, I joined a team of researchers to find solutions to the problems faced by women entrepreneurs as a result of the pandemic. An outcome of this research is that we've not only stayed in contact with the participants, but are now working collaboratively with them to find ways to facilitate and possibly develop workshops and training to help them deal with the challenges in this very difficult business context. This collaboration has presented a tremendously exciting opportunity to develop a deeper understanding between the academic community and the business community. Now I was motivated to start this PhD from my own experiences and in the hope that research such as this will help us to move beyond the image of the typical male entrepreneur to a situation where gender doesn't matter and both men and women are contributing to the entrepreneurial startups which shape all of our futures. I believe there's never been a more important time to be working on leveling the playing field Study after study is finding that women entrepreneurs have been disproportionately affected by the impact of the pandemic. This is partly due to underfunding, which means that their businesses may let be less resilient in such a harsh economic climate. I hope that the business and academic communities can continue to work together to ensure that women entrepreneurs don't just survive, but also thrive in our post-pandemic world. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. That's absolutely fascinating. So we'll go next on to the next speaker. And the next speaker to speak with us tonight is Linda Moot, who sits within the College of Biomedical and Life Sciences with her research on sepsis. So Linda, over to you. Uh, thank you, Karen. I'll share my screen. Great, perfect. Is it, is it up yet? It's up, yes. Yeah, great. Okay, yes. So as Karen has mentioned, uh, the, the, my PhD is about elucidating the role of the lipid GPR84 axis in the immune response in sepsis. And I know this is quite a mouthful. So uh, GPR84 is a receptor. And I'll get to what a receptor is in a bit. Uh, here you can see a picture at least of what it might look like. And it binds lipids. So that means it's small fatty molecules. But first of all, let's talk about sepsis because that's what actually drew me to this PhD. Sepsis is a type of, sepsis is caused by an infection. And infections fascinate me because they're kind of this reverse David versus Goliath situation. So you have this small mean David who just has a couple of weapons in his arsenal who manages to actually damage and potentially kill this big Goliath, which is us, with its big shield and its big weapons because our immune system is excellent. Most of the time, our immune system works really, really well. It's this fine-tuned, tightly regulated program that uh, defends us from all the microorganisms around us. Now, sepsis, however, is one of the leading causes of death worldwide. And it's actually a very uh, life-threatening situation that can happen to almost anyone. Now, different to a normal infection, it's not the infection that kills you, it's the immune response to it. So this is similar to David kicking Goliath in the shin and then Goliath knocking himself out. So where in this normally perfect program do things go wrong? Um, I'm part of the Project Sepsis group in Cardiff and we're trying to elucidate just that. So the first step in any immune response to an infection is that our immune cells are aware that there is an infection. So the white blood cells are patrolling our body to find infections, to find potential invaders. And they do this by being able to sense them. And they sense them using receptors. So receptors look something like this. They are structures on the surface of the cell that are able to very specifically bind molecules. So not any receptor can bind any molecule. This is a very specific interaction similar to a lock that can only be unlocked with the right key. So every receptor only binds very few molecules. And they help our cells in detecting bacterial viruses by binding, for example, bacterial particles or viral particles. When the receptor is activated by this particle, it sends a signal to the cell so that the cell knows that there is an invader. And this will change how the cell behaves because now it will stop patrolling the body. It will instead try to attack the invader. To do this, it will try to recruit more cells. So it starts releasing signals. And it also tries to poise the cells around it to fight with it against this invader. So it secretes signal to the other cells that say, let's fight. So our cells then fight the invading pathogen by both releasing harmful substances and also by trying to eat it. And this is a mechanism that really fascinates me. So I've got this video for you. You will see an immune cell coming from the bottom and you probably see these blue rods. These are the bacteria. And now you see the immune cell coming up and it just engulfs the bacterium, the bacteria. And then inside of its body, it's gonna have a little bubble with the bacteria in it. And then it injects this bubble with digestive enzymes and with acids um, ending up killing the bacteria. So a very important part of this immune response of this reaction is that it has to stop at some point because this uses a lot of energy and also the release of this damaging secretions can harm our body. 
And for this, another subset of cell, cells is drawn to the site of infection and they monitor the reaction. And at some point they will start releasing signals to the immune cells that should dampen the response that tells them to stop. And we think that precisely this mechanism is where there's a bug in the program when people actually have sepsis. So how does my receptor come into this? My receptor, we think, will play an important role in sepsis because it's actually not present on the cells as long as they're just patrolling the body. But when an immune cell has found a part of an invading pathogen or it has gotten a signal that there is an invading pathogen, it will suddenly have a lot of my receptor on its outer surface. Um, this, according to previous research, leads to more cells being drawn to the site of infection and also to uh, a higher release of the let's fight signals and also to the cells being more aggressive, trying to eat the bacteria. Um, so when we actually want to dampen the immune response in sepsis, this might sound like the receptor is bad, but that's actually not sure. And it's one of the things that I'm trying to find out in my PhD. Is the activation of this receptor a good thing or a bad thing? Now, I hope from my presentation, you don't feel like this right now, because this is kind of how I felt like at many moments in my PhD, trying to get my head around um, how receptors work, what is sepsis, what is the problem in sepsis, and how does this all come together? What I hope is that down the line, by being able to contribute a little puzzle piece of understanding of the role of my receptor in sepsis, that this will help us understand sepsis better. And only if we understand it better, we can also treat it better, maybe even by directly targeting my receptor. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Linda. That was really, really fascinating. And I can see that some questions are coming in on the um, Q&A. So I'd like to encourage people to do that. Um, I'm also happy for you uh, as speakers to answer them, type an answer in if you like, or we can try and get through them live. Um, so I encourage people to do that. And I'll be asking you, Linda, um, and Jill to join me again to try and answer some questions that have already come in as a panel at the end. So that'll be after our last speaker. So thank you very much, Linda. And our final speaker this evening, um, Eva, has just finished her PhD at Cardiff and is representing the College of Physical Sciences and Engineering. And she'll be talking, as I said, about her research into black holes in glaciers. Over to you, Eva. Thank you, Karen. Um, let me just share my screen. That's always tricky. Yeah, take your time. <laughs> okay, is it up? It's up, excellent, thank you. Lovely. Okay, so as Karen mentioned, um, I've just finished my PhD in glacial microbiology, and I would like to begin with telling you a bit uh, about my path and why did I choose it. Um, and I'm afraid there is no grand story there. Uh, I've just always liked being outdoors and I always liked biology and geology. And during my undergrad, I became interested um, in microbiology, mainly because microorganisms so, are so tiny, yet they affect our lives in so many ways. For example, what Linda said, uh, but also we use them in many ways, they produce uh, antibiotics for us, they produce insulin, so I find this fascinating. And as for glacial microbiology in particular, uh, this question is easy. I hate being cold and I really like microorganisms, so glaciers seem like a perfect place to be really, really cold and struggle to find any living form. And except of two scientists on the, on the surface, this glacier looks rather barren, perhaps lifeless, but it is in fact alive and billions and billions of organisms live on the surface and their favorite spot to live on the glaciers are these tiny black holes. You can see some of them in the top view on the left side here. And these black holes are called cryoconite holes and they were a topic of my PhD research. And why am I interested in this weird ice cold hotspots for life on glaciers? 
So the important fact is that microorganisms can live there and it's already fascinating enough, but they are also concentrated around the dark debris and they produce dark colorful pigments, which you can see on the surface here. And this causes the darkening of the surface of the ice. And this darkening can be seen from the satellite. So on the right panel here, you can see the dark zone on Greenland ice sheet uh, marked with the star and colorful microorganisms on the left, which inhabit the surface. And the fact that they are darkening the, the surface speeds up the melting of the ice. So this happens in the same way as you feel warmer in a black shirt on a sunny day than you feel in a white shirt. Uh, basically, dark color absorbs more sunlight and more heat. So we need to understand this darkening uh, and associated biological processes, associated microorganisms, uh, because we want to predict the future glacial uh, melt rates. And in my research, uh, I'm, I'm doing something unbelievable. I'm looking inside these tiny black holes, which you can see in the middle here. And I'm using various tools for this one, but here is an example. This is the micro sensor. And it is a really fragile thing. It has this tiny glass needle with a, a really tiny fragile tip. And I'm, I managed to break quite a few of them. Uh, but the, the thing which they allowed me is looking into the glacial sediments with a really fine resolution. So it was worth the hassle and worth the, uh, the cost of it and worth my poor knees getting frozen on the ice. Um, because I managed to look at the, at the sediments with unprecedented resolution. And what I could do with these microsensors, I could measure the oxygen in the sediments. And we discovered, my, the main discovery of, of my PhD was discovery that uh, within these tiny holes which you see on ice, there are even tinier zones, so, some kind of micro niches where there is no oxygen. And this has a lot of implications. For example, uh, the microorganisms which live there, they cannot use oxygen because it's not there. So they have to use different types of metabolism. They will use anoxic metabolism and they will produce different kinds of byproducts and different kinds of organic carbon than during normal, let's say common typical uh, oxygen metabolism. Um, and so, so basically, the, these little tiny holes are more complex than we thought. Previously, we thought they are well oxygenated. Well, that's not true. We now need to take this into account uh, when we model the biological processes on ice. And scientists estimate that cryoconite holes, so these tiny black holes on ice, can contribute between 3 to 15% to glacial melt, depending on the coverage of the surface. And we don't know what happens in the future. But we know that not only they contribute to the melting, they also produce this uh, organic carbon, which is released downstream. It can fertilize the oceans. Uh, it can influence nearby environments. So we really want to understand what's going on inside. We really want to understand exactly what bio, uh, biological processes are taking pla place in order to be able to model the glacial carbon cycle and glacial melt in the future. And I'm, I am a tiny part of, uh, of this link and of this research. And I would like to conclude with um, telling you a bit about the challenges of my PhD. And usually what comes to mind is obvious challenges of fieldwork in these conditions which are harsh and cold, but I actually enjoyed it uh, a lot. And what I found really um, challenging in doing a PhD is being your own boss and staying motivated. Because PhD is an enormous task and you feel quite lonely sometimes because it seems to never end. And you have this huge project in mind, but it changes a lot and quite rapidly depending on the results you get or results you don't get, depending on the things you imagine and things which turn out wrong. So you have to sort of think really small scale and stay focused on small and medium task, tasks, but you have to hope that in the end, this will give you a huge PhD. And fortunately for me, it did uh, add up to a PhD, but 
it's not always the case. So it can be quite stressful. And that's all from me for today. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Eva. Thank you. I think the, the photograph at the end, you look so happy doing your research. <laughs> so that's great. But thank you for also yep. sharing the challenges and thank you for your fascinating talk. So thank you all Thanks. so much. If Eva starts, stop sure oh, she's done it already. Thank yep. you. And the other panelists can join me. I'd like to thank you all for your excellent talks tonight. They're all so different, but they're all really fascinating. I can see questions coming in. And I think without any further ado, I'll open the question and answer session and encourage people if they want to submit questions, we'll do our best, best to answer them either um, in person or, or in writing. Um, but we, I want to start with um, some questions which were put to us in advance actually. And, and these are kind of about what, you know, general questions about what it's like to be doing a PhD. And, you know, I know from my own experience, I think listening to you all, it took me back to those years of, of struggle and, and elation. And, you know, doing a PhD absolutely can be exciting, invigorating, depression, depressing at times, but absolutely rewarding. And I quite often tell people it was the best three years of my life. So first question is around that, and I'll put this to Linda. So how do you navigate those highs and lows? Um, yeah, I've definitely experienced those highs and lows, and I think Eva had a really good explanation of um, what is the, the struggle in a PhD. I think really what helped me most is my social network really, both to have people to wind to and um, to be able to unwind and think of something else and, and meeting people, which of course wasn't that much possible in the past year anymore. Um, but yeah, that has really been the main thing. And then apart from that, having hobbies to myself that are rewarding. So when things in the lab aren't really proceeding, you, you still had a good run in the morning and nothing can take that away from you. And then the last thing really to celebrate every small victory and every small step, and just to realize that I'm not gonna make big leaps in my PhD, but I'm gonna take a lot of small steps forward and a lot of small steps backwards as well, unfortunately. Yeah, thank you, Linda. That's really good advice. And I think that, that advice, you know, you're obviously looking after your resilience in terms of um, getting out and running and so on. And that's really important, isn't it, for all of us, not just people doing a PhD. And I guess, um, you know, for me, realising that actually if something went wrong in an experiment, because I was an experimentalist, that's a, that's a result. You know, even when something doesn't work out as you thought it would, that is a result because it prevents other people from doing that. So, you know, we have to, it's important to recognize those as well. So thank you so much for sharing that. So um, the second question, I think I'll ask this to um, Eva. And, you know, your, your research will have, no doubt have impact, but what would you like the impact of it to be? Um, I guess I would be the happiest if people would actually use it and I mean like the scientific community so I mentioned to you the modeling of the carbon cycle on glaciers and modeling of the of the glacial melt and I know that modeling is quite complex as well but if I could contribute uh, a little piece of knowledge to this one this would be really ideal and I think I would also like to be remembered as a person who studied these black holes and as a person who discovered something interesting about them so yeah that would be ideal for me, I think. <laughs> yeah, that would be brilliant, wouldn't it? Yeah. Do, do, do you um, perhaps want something named after you in that field? Oh, this, give me another 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Excellent. My, yeah, one of my professors just got a glacier in Antarctica named after him, but he is wow. 60 at the moment. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it needn't take that long. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> okay thank you so much Eva okay so um in terms of doing a PhD I mean you know it's it's three years plus and when people think about the three years of their PhD I know that it's it's not just an eight hour a day job you know it's it it, it is all encompassing isn't it so it's a huge in, uh, commitment in terms of personal time but it's also a huge cost you know funding wise in terms of um you know just funding the phd and so on so that's that's always on my mind really you know how are people funding their their studies so um i think i'd like to ask that to jill um so how is your phd funded could you share that with us and and what was the implications of that for you yeah of course yes i'm fortunate enough to be fully funded by an esrc economic social research council 
doctoral training partnership um, studentship. So that means my fees are paid. And it's taken, um, it's allowed me to concentrate in full on the PhD without having to think about work. I've stepped back from work at the moment because I think it takes a certain amount of planning to um, give the time to the PhD. But it's not just financial. I think being part of the ESRC network as well has opened up other training opportunities. The um, encourage attendance at conferences, it gives access to internships. And moving on from what Linda was saying, it's not just the financial, it's another layer of support, another network to call upon to help you through the whole PhD process. So it's been tremendously valuable for me. Yeah, exactly. And, and I'm really glad that you touched on all the aspects of, of, of help that you need. It's not just financial, it's networking. And, you know, people don't realise that if you if you want to disseminate your, your, your research, you have to go to conferences, you also have to go to conferences to learn more. So there's lots and lots of costs around um, taking a PhD, aren't there? OK, so we have got lots of questions coming in on the question and answer. And uh, line and I'm going to try and navigate through these and just to people who are submitting questions and if I don't get to your question I'm really really sorry um, but it's quite hard to do both and I'll try and make sure that I share out the questions so we don't just ask one of our um, presenters so I'll, I'll start with a question that came in um, it, from Andrew Westall. So this is for Jill again. And um, Andrew says that this is both a fascinating and worrying insight. And do you think there are other parts of the world where uh, women entrepreneurs have equal opportunities and flourish more? And how can we learn from that and draw on, on those experiences in the UK? I think that it's certainly the United States um, can come out well and been very strong at supporting women entrepreneurs. But the, it depends very much upon the um, economic um, fiscal situation of the country. But the UK is in the top 10, depends on which um, surveys are taken. But it does do well, but we could do a lot better. And it's not just the economic environment. It's the whole thinking around the stereotypical entrepreneur. It's how to move away from that way of thinking. And a big part of it, I think, is to have women as mentors, as women as role models, to encourage other women to come up and be involved in the entrepreneurial community. And I think that will make it a lot easier to get the support there. Thanks, Jill. And I'll just follow up from that. There's a, there's a question there from TJ that kind of relates to this. So, you know, how can Cardiff University help um, female um, student entrepreneurs in particular? You know, what, is there anything you can think of that we could do in particular for female entrepreneurs to, to start redressing this? I think something, a deeper collaboration with the business community, as I say about mentorship and role models, that's a big thing for young women coming up. And if they actually see someone going through the motions and doing that, it makes it a lot easier for them. So, <coughs> excuse me, that's why I was particularly excited by what I've been involved in recently. It's deepening that understanding between the academic community and the business community so that they can help one another. Yeah, OK, so we'll try and uh, we'll, we'll try and work on that. I think that's yes. a good idea. You know, I'm sure we do set up various networking events from all sorts of things, but building a network and then encouraging that network to mentor and perhaps sponsor and support would be really helpful or they can talk together the better that yeah be yeah exactly okay i've scrolled to the end now and i've got uh, this was a question that i was going to ask as well actually from jenna so and it's to eva and eva um you finished your phd but you haven't told us what you're doing next so what's the next steps for you uh, thanks for the question so i was lucky enough to actually secure a postdoc, which is a next step in a scientific career, I would say, but uh, it's in a different topic. It's more of a methodology. So I will set up a new new methods of um, studying microorganisms. And I hope that in the future I will come back to glacial microbiology and maybe use the methods I will invent. But you can't always choose where you go. You can, yeah, you can choose where you go or what research you will do. It, it's never together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, and there's there's a theme amongst all your speakers on, on kind of self isolate oh, on isolation, on self motivation, and being resilient. You know, in order to progress your own work. 
Um, so I think I'll put this question to Linda. Um, how do you think women can support each other to be strong when we're facing such challenges, you know, in international in the in the week of International Women's Day? And I, I've done a couple of events already where I've had mm. tremendous support and, and love from other women, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, supporting each other. So so do you think there's a way that we can we can support each other to be strong in these challenges? And, um, you know, is there a role for the alumni of the university to help here, do you think? Um, yeah, I think that uh, actually hearing from alumni can be very inspiring and it can be really helpful to see how other women have navigated maybe challenges that might be specific to women, because women might still handle certain problems differently, maybe be less assertive in some moments. Um, what I see in, in my social network with my female friends, and I have many female friends who are also doing PhDs, is that um, we really encourage each other to, to be assertive, to, to believe in ourselves, um, to, to believe in our success, to, to be confident, essentially. And um, yeah, I think that alumni could play a big role in this as well, uh, even as role models as well. It's nice to have positive role models um yeah yeah, so I guess the more events we can do where we can connect you up with alumni um would be a benefit to all PhD students mm -hmm. yeah um right okay well I can see you know you as panelists you've been working very hard because you've been answering some of the questions by writing the answer in the in the boxes so that's great um there's a question here um that the for well there's two questions left for Jill actually so the first one is about disseminating your thesis so you you, you know you've got your thesis and obviously that'll be written up and, and disseminated but beyond the, the the PhD you know book on the on the shelf um how will you be using your thesis to influence um and shape our future economy to make life better I've been in, already been involved I'm quite um actively involved in business angel community so I've been Although I'm only, I'm only halfway through at the moment, so I've still been using the information to date. I've taken part in panel discussions. I'm still contributing to the ongoing debate and helping to inform policymakers, really, keeping the conversation going as I'm working through. But I haven't re yet reached sort of data collection stage, so I'm still very much at the early stage. But I think it's just keeping the conversation going and keeping talking to policymakers within the community. That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, I can see that the time is ticking away and I think we're just about out of time um, for questions now. So um, I would like to, uh, and the time has gone really quickly, hasn't it? I'm sure the speakers will agree with me that, uh, that this time has gone really, really quickly. But, um, you know, I first of all, I'd like to thank Jill Linda and Eva for your time and your expertise today. It's been absolutely brilliant, you know, hearing your presentations and um, having the opportunity to chat with you and also having the opportunity to put questions to you. So thanks very much for your frank and honest answers to those questions. Um, I would like to thank our webinar audience for being with us. Um, it's really exciting that you're able to come and join us today. And I think one of the Benefits, if there have been benefits of this new way of working, is that we are able to put on these things quite easily and, you know, encourage people to uh, join in and we don't have to travel or anything to do these things. So, you know, thank you for joining us virtually today. Um, and if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, um, we'll follow up with you directly. And I do hope you found this um, insightful. We're so proud of the research taking place at Cardiff University. And, you know, you've only just, you've seen three of our PhD students, but there are hundreds across the university doing equally fascinating and important research. And, you know, we have um, a whole range of inspiring international women for, from all over the globe who make up a crucial part of our research community. So um, if you'd like to um, support us or find out more about what we're doing, particularly in, in, the, in terms of um, supporting our, our research community, we'll pop a link in the comments. Um, so we have a, a really good programme of events coming up um, On our next event is on Wednesday the 21st of April at 5.15 till 6 o'clock and that's the immune system and its role in brain health and disease.
Um, and that's a chance um, to hear from academics on how the immune system impacts on our brain health. And in particular, something that is so close to all of our, many of our hearts is it's particularly its role in Alzheimer's disease. So you'll receive an email in the next few days with a copy of this recording and um, some links to register for upcoming events. So um, I hope that we will be welcoming you back to another event very soon. Uh, I just repeat my thanks to our three brilliant women speakers. You're all amazing and I wish you all the huge luck in, in everything that you do. And uh, so all that's left for me to say is thank you very much and uh, bye bye everybody. <laughs>